I'm delighted to uh, introduce this panel and we have John Elder joining us again from Elder Research. We have Ken Finnegan from the IDA Ireland, Barry O'Sullivan from Insight and UCC, and Patricia Scanlon from Soapbox, Lab, Soapbox Labs. So um, just to remind you all, there is a drinks and canopies reception coming up very soon, so this is going to be a little bit lighthearted, um, so uh, we can enjoy, enjoy a few drinks later on and, and discuss the outcomes of this uh, very important and very serious uh, issue that we're all facing. So of course, this, the technical, technological singularity or singularity is the idea that technological progress, particularly in artificial intelligence, will reach a tipping point to where machines are exponentially smarter than humans. And as far back as the 1960s, Alan Turing warned about the ultra-intelligent machine, which he defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of an, any man however, or woman, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines, now that's a scary thought, that would then unquestionably be, there would then unquestionably be, be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of mankind would be left far behind. So, um, Elon Musk is, is worried about this. Stephen Hawking is worried about this. Elon Musk created OpenAI, a billion-dollar non-profit dedicated to ensuring the development of art, artificial general intelligence, which is another term for, for human-level intelligence, that, to make sure that it's beneficial to humanity. Um, a few reasons why, why the singularity may be close. Well, first of all, Moore's Law, right? It's going to come to an end soon. People are concerned about Moore's Law coming to an end because because of the number of chips on a transistor cannot, cannot be continuously shrunk because you'll end up in physical limitations of, of the electronics there and you'll have quantum effects and all sorts of problems. But Ray Kurzweil uh, disagrees with that and he thinks that's an arbitrary measure of computational power. And a more interesting measure is, is to suggest that the number, number of calculations per thousand dollars should be the ultimate measure of computational progress. And under his... Um, reckoning, that's actually going faster than Moore's law and can continue for decades to come. So imagine that, the power of computers are going to continue at a rate faster than Moore's law for decades to come under this new measure of calculations per thousand dollars. And I think that's what matters because uh, money, money talks in uh, computational power and industry. So um, robots are doing human jobs. You know, GM assembly line in 1962. If you see Tesla's assembly line today, you'll probably see some fairly smart uh, robots uh, doing a lot of jobs. Welding, um, you have your Roomba vacuum cleaners, came out in 2002. A lot of people are, are loving those. Uh, Rethink Robots has made robots like Baxter and Sawyer, who can work safely around humans and learn new tasks in minutes. So, um, so as the power of technology grows uh, and continues to grow, uh, robots are going to continue to take on even more tasks, and that's, that's clear. And even in the creative pursuits, one book written by a machine was recently accepted as, as a submission for the prestigious Hoshi Shinichi Literary Award in Japan. So they are becoming creative too. So with all of that in mind, I think it's time to talk about the singularity. <laughs> so, um, John, uh, in your abstract for your talk, for your talk you wrote that um, AI has fallen laughably short of its potential. And we've been promised this um, AI revolution and singularity for a long time, but it always seems to be 10 years away. And you said it's fallen laughably short of its potential until all of a sudden it hasn't. <laughs> Is AI finally about to deliver on this hype surrounding it? over the previous decades, and if so, or if not, why, why not? So, over to you, John. Yeah, the, as I mentioned in my talk, the, some of the jokes around AI1 was in terms of language translation. Uh, you know, a famous AI researcher was asked, you know, how, how close is it? And it was about a decade away in his estimation. So a decade later, he was asked, uh, what, do you, what do you think of your prediction? He says, I see no need to update it. In other words, it's still a decade away. <laughs> you know, and so that was kind of the, the it was always under delivering. And then in AI's favor, a lot of times something new would be developed and it would be spun out of AI. And so AI was always left with the hard research problems and always sunk back into the trough of disillusionment in the Gartner formulation of the hype cycle. 
Um, but AI always was hyped and always was under delivering and uh, uh, it was kind of uh, painful to listen to because uh, they were getting money, they were extracting money from gullible people, you know, and it wasn't going to the deserving stuff that you were working on, right? So, uh, but, but all of a sudden, AI is delivering. You know, AI's got the driverless cars and it's winning at poker and it's winning at Go and it's crushed chess a long time ago and so forth. And, uh, and so it's really impressive. And then those aren't dummies that are throwing, that are a little worried about the singularity and about general purpose. So there, there's more of a reason to believe in some of these possibilities than, than ever before. And, and we'll explore some of the, the limits and so forth. Just to, to lay my cards on the table, I, I don't believe the singularity will occur. I don't believe that, that our, the human intelligence is just on a continuum of computing power. But there are a lot of tasks that, that will be taken over. And you don't have to match human ability to still be useful. Um, the, the standard that is being used in some of our presentations are, can you beat the world champion at blah? But you don't have to beat the world champion at getting an airline reservation to be useful at a task of you know, helping someone get an airline reservation or, or make a translation of a, of a document to understand the gist of what's going on to be helpful in your daily life. And, so, and, and having the immediate free ability to do that is extraordinarily powerful. So the special purpose AI is, getting, is, is having a heyday right now where special purpose tasks are being taken over by AI trained on that purpose so it's not general purpose intelligence, but special purpose intelligence. And, and niche after niche is, is being sort of conquered right now with existing technology, and it's very powerful. So it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a great heyday, I think, for that in the near future. And it would be interesting to see how many tasks can be carved away and, uh, and gained for the AI world. So, uh, so you don't believe it's ever going to happen, the singularity? I don't believe it'll ever happen. Ever, never going to happen. But a lot of useful things will come from it. So um, uh, over to you, Barry. Um, do you think the singularity or, or the computational power achieving this general intelligence is, is inevitable or also are you in the camp of it'll never happen? So I, think it's <laughs> I, think it's, so I put my cards on the table. I don't think the singularity is ever going to happen for a whole bunch of reasons, but I suppose um, that's not to say it's not a useful thought experiment, which it is. Um, but I think, you know, the, um, I've been on debates about the singularity with Kurzweil, <laughs> and um, I think th th there's a flaw in his argument, which is that um, it's, you know, so whether, so there's a couple of things. So on the computational power thing, yes, absolutely. So the, you know, there's massive growth in the power of computers, that's true, but if you think about the, the brain as a computational system, the amount of power it takes is tiny, right? It's mm -hmm. absolutely minuscule. You wouldn't, light a, you wouldn't light a bulb from the amount of power that your brain takes. So if you're waiting, for, if you, so if you, if you're waiting for more computational power, then you're on the wrong road, basically, because that is not how it works, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's something fundamentally different about these things. But at the same time, I suppose artificial, if you think of artificial flight, we didn't build... We didn't build an artificial bird, right? So, so um, I think something that, is, that demonstrates AI doesn't have to look like a human mind. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the second point. And I suppose the third point is that all of the successes, that, you know, so John mentioned many of the successes. If you think about them, the components of them are just are, you know, tools or AI systems, very, very narrow AI systems that can do very narrow tasks very, very well. And even things as complex as driving, these are engineered combinations of these. They're not general intelligences, right? Um, and in fact, there is no scientific evidence at all to suggest that a singularity is even possible, right? So, um, you know, Stephen Hawking, who's a, you know, a bright individual, and Elon Musk, who is a very successful individual, um, you know, just because, they say, just because they're worried about this thought experiment doesn't mean it's true, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think the singularity will ever occur. Um, but certainly what's going to happen is that what we call AI is going to have massive impact, as John says. Mm -hmm. But I suppose one thing that I will say, and this might be controversial, is that the successes that we've had with AI, they exhibit absolutely none of the capabilities, none of the characteristics of intelligence at all, actually. Mm -hmm. So the problem with AI is that it has a bad label, because yeah. we don't build artificial intelligence systems, we build smart tools. 
Um, so, for example, deep learning tells you nothing at all about human intelligence. Um, and in fact, the reason it's so successful is that we can just function fit functions that have billions of parameters and, you know, for most useful things that we want to use that for, perception like vision, machine translation, such functions are just enough to do that. So they seem intelligent, but they're not. There's nothing at all intelligent about them. And that's coming from someone whose you know, entire professional career is in the field of AI. <laughs> Tricia, uh, uh, help me out here. Uh, <laughs> we need a believer. Um, you, you design smart devices that can understand human voice, right down to kids who have no tolerance for machines that, have, uh, that won't interact in a natural environment. These machines, these voice-connected devices are connected to a, a super powerful internet but insane amounts of computational power. Uh, is it not just inevitable that the, uh, this singularity is going to happen? And I, look at this, <laughs> I look at this very differently, I think. Um, when you say, is it going to happen? When? Right? So, you know, in the next, it, by 2040, no, totally agree with you, right? Um, 100 years? 200 years? Like, are you honestly thinking that in 300 years, we're still talking about silicon? We're not, like, you know, and there's more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that have been dreamt of in your philosophy. And just because we don't know how it's going to happen and we can't imagine it on the physical devices or in the, we, we're talking processing power here, mm. we're talking about cloud. We didn't even have cloud, like, you know, we didn't have, so when I think about it, I think we don't know what's going to exist in 40 years. So how could you possibly say it's not going to happen? And as I said earlier on, you can't stop progress. And, you know, I think... Honestly, I think Elon Musk and, and Hawking and all that have a point. I, I don't think everybody needs to push the panic buttons right now. But if you don't think about it and you don't talk about it, um, you, got, you can put rules and laws in place mm -hmm. to deal with this, but the people you've got to worry about are, you know, the King John, <laughs> uns of the place who aren't going to play by the rules. Like, so, mm -hmm. you know... I think it's a very interesting thing that we can say, oh, we must control it, we must regulate it, really, because the people you've got to worry about aren't going to follow, you know, follow that. And mm -hmm. it's the same with nuclear power, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a, an amazing, clean energy source, but mm -hmm. it can also destroy the planet. Mm -hmm. So I think, we all, I think it has to be a, a longer-term conversation mm -hmm. and for the next generation and the generation after that to be cognizant and have real conversations about, yeah, maybe not in my lifetime. Maybe, but maybe not in my lifetime. But I think um, I'm in the same camp as you, Patricia. I believe, um, you know, progress is, is marching forward and mm. who are we to predict where we'll be in 10, 20, 30, 40 years? And I think Kurzweil himself has, has put a 10-year uh, prediction on it, but I, I would be a little bit further out of it like yourself. Um, mm. let's, let's move on to, you know, quickly, I suppose. Um, well, you know, let's imagine... It's inevitable. Like, I know you, you guys are totally opposed to this. Uh, over to you, Ken. Um, Europe, um, to some extent, has been very focused on GDPR regulation. Now, I don't want to go into GDPR because we could talk about it all day. But has it missed the risk that is AI? Uh, and how does that relate to, to, to the... Regu as, as, um, as we've said, regulation and rules that, that people are looking for to try to corral this thing and, and prevent it from becoming the catastrophe that it may become in where it's 40 years or 100 years time. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> I guess from, from our perspective, actually, GDPR has been a very important conversation from an IDA perspective for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, we're very much focusing on AI as well. And a lot of people on the stage here know that and probably in the audience as well. Um, we had an event last May um, to discuss actually all the topics are in and around AI and how to make Ireland kind of like a, we, as we, we termed it, AI island. So um, what's, what's our, our, we wanted to benchmark where we are now in terms of capability. Actually, the last speakers were talking about um, um, understanding a team, so selecting 41 people and understanding their capabilities. And that's kind of what we were doing as well from an uh, from a economic development perspective. So we're looking at Team Ireland, if you want understanding what the capability that exists here in industry um, from an academic perspective um, and, and from a national perspective. We, it was a really interesting event that day, actually. Mm -hmm. We had a design-led um, workshop where we had industry, Irish companies, academia. We also had the unions there. We had the military in the room as well. Mm -hmm. We had social innovators. Just to have that conversation about actually what does AI mean to Ireland and yeah. what does the future look like from an AI perspective? It sound, just, yeah, I know Barry, you have a point on GDPR and, and relations to AI, but just before we get to that, um, 
Ken, I think like what the IDA is focusing on is like how do we could become leaders in AI technology and AI capabilities, but that's that's propelling us towards you know <laughs> if so, that is propelling us towards an inevitable, it's actually pushing so I, us in that direction. But we're I don't think we're doing anything on the other side to say well what are the regulations and rules we should be pushing into Europe for this? Well, or are we? Well, actually, one of the points that came up. So we wanted to kind of benchmark where we were as a country see what, the, uh, what um, our team was or what their special capabilities, what was their unique differentiator. But in addition, it was like we, we took feedback from everybody in the audience that day to understand actually what are the blockers for us pr to progress in terms of making Ireland kind of like a, a, a global leader, if you want, in artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And we have actually, we've been addressing all those, um, whether, whether this brings us to a singularity, <laughs> nah, I'm not too sure. You're not here. And this is really fun, by the way. I, I don't get to ever have conversations about singularity when I'm sitting in front of clients of IDA. But, um, <laughs> but it's, it was really interesting listening to the challenges. Like, for example, one of the challenges was... Um, in and around access to open data. So we all know that, that data is the, is the fuel for, for artificial intelligence. Um, the perception out there was that, okay, Ireland's pretty bad. Turns out actually we're third in Europe from a, um, from a government perspective, an access to open data um, mm -hmm. perspective, um, which is pretty impressive. And we've, I guess it's like finding out those issues that the, the perception of issues out there and being able to address them, maybe we can um, uh, speed up our progress towards the singularity. One thing that I think that what I'm seeing on the ground at the moment is the whole idea of convergence. So yeah, yeah. Ap applied um, AI versus core AI. And we're just starting to see kind of like organizations start to collaborate together. And I think uh, one of the, I, w I actually asked a question um, over Twitter before of the last panel to understand where does Ireland rank in terms of tech and sport because I'd be, it sounds like it's a perfect match in Ireland. Sport is uh, very popular, but also tech. We have, a very, we have a fine pedigree in technology. Mm -hmm. And are we up there in terms of that convergence? Are we up there in terms of on the league tables from a, from a sports tech perspective? Because we can see like ag tech becoming more popular. FinTech has become more popular in the country. So it's that, that weak AI I can mm -hmm. see is progressing on. When will we hit the kind of like the... Uh, That's great. Always be selling Ireland, Ken. That's always great selling stuff. Ireland. <laughs> All right, what are your thoughts on the GDPR regulation AI issue? Yes, there is actually a direct link between AI and the GDPR. So in... Um, so I'm one of those people who reads this kind of legislation because I'm that kind of nerd. But, um, <laughs> but there's a... Article 22 in the GDPR talks about algorithmic decision making. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it basically says that, a, that a, an EU citizen has the right not to be subject to solely uh, decisions that are solely made by algorithmic means. So in other words, um, you, have, you will have a right as, a, as an EU citizen not to be subject to um, an entirely a decision made by an AI system. Mm -hmm. And I suppose what that means is that the AI system will need to be able to explain itself to you, or you'll be able to interrogate the decision. Mm -hmm. And I suppose um, last year I did this interview with Silicon Republic where there's a sort of a glib title to it, which is that AI, that AI will become illegal in Europe in 2018. And what I meant was, <laughs> yes, that, um, what I meant was that there are, there are many AI techniques, so deep learning, for example, mm. which can't actually explain themselves. Absolutely. So if you were a human being and you know, you're interacting with a deep learning system that's deciding whether or not you should get a certain type of insurance premium, and if you're not happy, you say, well, why did you give me that insurance premium? It's actually currently not technologically possible Absolutely. for a deep learning system to explain why, right? So, yeah. so you know, according to the GDPR as currently written and AI research as it currently stands, um, there are techniques that are not that will not be compliant with the GDPR. So, I think that's something that's worth thinking about. We'll just outlaw it. There we go. We're done. No, no risk of a singularity <laughs> unless it comes from North Korea or, or yeah, Silicon yeah, Valley yeah, yeah. or somewhere else. No, but, but you know, <laughs> you know, this is it's, I suppose it's great. If from, deep from, learning is outlawed, only outlaws will use deep learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll, go to, it'll go to the dark web, right? So, uh, the, um, but I suppose, it, but you know, the flip side is that it's, it's a that's a good thing for us as data scientists because it sort, of, it sort of tells us where we should be doing research, which is on explainable artificial intelligence, right? So that's so we've very very little time left. So let's do this real quick and just for fun. So, if really short answers, each person. Um, if the singularity does happen, how will we know? Uh, we won't. We'll all be dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Easy. We will have solved. This. So we, we will, the singularity will have happened at the at the moment in time when we when we also have solved the problem of immortality. Mm. Um, <laughs> when I guess when we got, all live in this utopian society where the robots will do everything for us and we can actually pursue what really interests us. Okay, John. 
that is one of the one of the goals and hallmarks of the singularity crowd is to download your consciousness and have a type of immortality so I think when we feel a sense of loss of control that the, the computers are pushing us around, sometimes <laughs> yeah. happens to you at the checkout. The matrix. Yeah, well, there, we when you get to the, it's the matrix. Years, I felt that years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so we start to recognize that the singularity has happened. Uh, what happens next, very briefly? <laughs> <laughs> Sit back and let the robots do it. Okay. I don't know, I think we, we enjoy our immortality because I think that we will <laughs> solve the same problem. <laughs> Ken? Yeah, what happens next? It's an interesting question. It's like uh, that philosophical question, what is intelligence and what is consciousness? consciousness? Will the machines be able to tell us what that is? Because we can't answer that question. We, we hope we're still amusing to our machine overlords. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Imagine, imagine if there was a singularity, you could come up with some fantastic jokes, right? So we would just be laughing for all eternity. Like, how good would that be? <laughs> you can ask Alexa at the moment, tell me a joke, Alexa. And, uh, so, uh, jokes. show of hands, please. Is the singularity inevitable? Yes. <laughs> In the audience, please. How many would say it's inevitable? And first of all, ever, ever, ever. 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 Yes, there you go. That's okay, we got a good sixty, seventy percent. <laughs> How many people say? <laughs> Do that 60, again. There's only six or seven people. <laughs> no, 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 no. How, many, how many people would say it can never happen? Never, the same ever, the same yeah, never ever Even no, in 200, 300 years, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're very confused. So with that, maybe we'll continue this conversation over a few drinks and, and some food in the experience hall. After thanks I so say much. a few thank yous and closing remarks. So thanks thank very much to our panel. It was thank very you. much fun. Great fun. Thank you.